Oh, hi, how are you guys? I'm so glad to be here with you. I'm Dr. Jerry Cartsnell, a board certified pediatrician. And today we're gonna to be talking about why is my child hitting me? But before we do that, uh, we have some things to go over. Don't, don't, first of all, don't do this to your kids. This is a list I have today. I uh, actually got yesterday of 38 different supplements, uh, over 53 capsules per day. And this child doesn't like to eat. Well, we're full of all kinds of stuff. Remember, when we do things, we want to make sure that there's a core of things that we need to have, like vitamin D, and if you're iron deficient, iron, and if you're not taking calcium, calcium. But the rest of the things need to be targeted, targeted for language, for speech, for behaviors, for hitting, whatever we're doing. But in, either they're going to work or they're not going to work. And if they don't work, we have a time frame to figure out that they're not working and we make some dose adjustments and we get rid of them. Um, this whole thing is costing mom probably eight to $800 to $1,000 a month plus 53 caps a day. Now, I don't know if any of you, I, I asked mom, I said, how do you think you'd feel if you took all of those in one day? I've tried to take a few supplements, too many, and it doesn't feel good inside. So I want to make sure that um, we don't overload what we're doing to our kids because some laboratory report says that we need it or someone on, uh, they said on the internet that we need it. Uh, I tend to always focus on things that, um, that are clinically relevant. In other words, when we do something like, say, melatonin, you're sleeping or we're using this and we're having bowel movements, I try to stay away from just things that you need because the laboratory report says it. The other thing I want you to know is I have a new working model of the coronavirus. Isn't this cool with the spikes and everything? Um, but actually, uh, little tykes made this before everybody else knew about them. And uh, if you were wondering where little tykes uh, is made, it's, it's actually made in China, of course. But it's a great illustration when people talk about the coronavirus and the, the uh, vaccine is supposed to uh, have your cells make these little spikes and then those cells release the spikes into the bloodstream. Your immune system doesn't like the little spikes, uh, so it makes antibodies to the little spikes. And uh, but I thought you'd get a, a nice kick that little tykes has been on top of this for years, actually. Okay, well, let's get into something a little more serious, and that is uh, children who are hitting a, a caretaker. And whenever I say caretaker, I think of somebody who works you know, in the graveyard or something. Uh, that's a nice way of saying mom, dad, a nanny, a grandma, a grandparent, who is ever overseeing the um, the day-to-day -day operations of the child, even if it is at ABA therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, what we're what we're talking about is working with children who are um, punching, biting, hitting, kicking, headbutting. Uh, generally, the people they love, people that they know well, but something isn't going well. And well, why why does that happen? Well, the, the number one reason that I I see is denial of access. And uh, if I had to pick one thing that they're having denial of access to, it's course electronics okay they're not um, getting access to the iPhone the iPad or the television but it can be anything uh, whatever they want to be doing um, it's a it's a denial to access it can also be a response to anxiety it, it's just building up so much pressure inside of them that they are striking out um, at their their loved ones that anxiety can be, again, because whatever in their mind isn't going the way that it's supposed to be going, um, that creates a sense of anxiety, which feeds right into obsessive compulsive behaviors. They're obsessed with something going the way it should go, and it doesn't, and uh, the anxiety follows and it builds and um, they, will, they will hit you. When that OCD or anxiety gets in the way, then it does translate into some kind of physical outburst. It could be screaming or yelling, but today we're talking about when the, the child will strike at a, a caregiver. 
Yeah, this can happen when you try to insert yourself into their rituals and stop something. They do not like that, right? If you've had one of those kids. Um, it's like trying to get in between two dogs fighting. It doesn't usually go well for you. Sometimes it's because you didn't take, you took a right turn instead of a left turn and they, they wanted you to go left. Uh, or you didn't stop at their favorite fast food restaurant. You know, they recognize the golden arches and you're supposed to stop there. Um, again, or, or not buying a toy. You go into Walmart and you don't want to buy the child's 22nd Buzz Lightyear or something like that. But generally they're obsessed with an idea. The idea doesn't manifest in your ability to meet their need and it will translate into an aggressive outburst. Constipation. Anytime that uh, the child has a full sewer system whatever they do for a living, whatever they do for their autism gets worse. So if they have seizures, they're going to have more seizures. If they have anxiety, they're going to have more anxiety if the sewer system's full. And certainly if they're prone to hit you, hit dad, hit whomever, uh, it's going to be amplified. So you could almost think of constipation as an, an amplifier. Headaches, we can't overlook that. You know, when parents tell me that my child on some days is just really combative, um, I'll say, well, why don't we give that child some Motrin on that day? So maybe they're having a headache or belly pain, right? But something might be hurting physically. Lack of sleep. They're not sleeping well. And they're just grouchy. And they're just irritable. And uh, so we, we have to make sure that uh, the children are, are sleeping well. Some of the kids, and I just had one today, oppositional. They're always oppositional. And whatever you ask them to do, the first thing is no, and they want to hit. It's like a no and a hit, a no and a hit. Um, that's, that's that oppositional defiance. And actually, the psychiatrists, they call it oppositional defiant disorder. What does that mean? They're being oppositional, right? They're, they're, they're not working with you. They're working against you. Supplements. I've actually put kids on supplements that, for some darn reason, evoke a very negative uh, response and they will strike out and hit and it's like ooh we can't have that we need to stop medications um, I just got uh, an email from a patient just fit right in uh, this child was clearly being aggressive when the neurologist put them on a seizure medicine called zonzamide and just made the kid um, very aggressive um, toward whoever and this this child knows mom knows dad knows the the uh, the person who stays with him to, to help him, and he just became Sid Vicious. So in that case, it was the Zonzamide can do it. So the medications that we use, the supplements that we can use. And then again, hormones, right? Uh, and, you know, when I think of puberty hormones, you know, you and I are thinking 12, 13, 14, but I've had these kids as early as four um, have a spike in the release of their, their puberty hormones, which should not be happening at age four. But you measure them and their, their DHEA, the, the male hormones are just, even in the girls, the male hormones in the girls are just skyrocketing. And that just is, is like gasoline on, on a fire. So we do have lots of reasons for the aggressive behavior. Now, the treatment for the aggressive behavior, in my eyes, needs to be figured out. And again, today, I mean, it's just like, I pick a topic and the patient load fits that topic. Uh, you go to the psychiatrist and they consider nothing from the neck down. It's always the brain. And remember, psychiatrists are the only doctors who really don't examine the organ they're treating. They just throw stuff at it. And um, Celexa does not work on aggression. Okay, Risperdal does not work on aggression. If you're constipated and that's what's triggering your aggression, why would you give Risperdal? Why wouldn't you give something to help relieve the constipation? So this kid's been on Risperdal, and beside gaining a lot of weight, didn't do anything for the aggression. Then was put on Celexa, and that hasn't done anything, so now we have to wean that. And now it's up to me to figure out the other sources. Oh, by the way, this child I was speaking about um, only has one bowel movement a week. Really? One bowel movement a week, and we wonder why he tends to be on the aggressive, combative side. So it's like, okay, that was kind of a gimme. Uh, hopefully that's all it is. But there's probably bacteria and yeast growing in there because if you think about it, we have all this sewage 
sitting at 98.6 degrees in a dark, wet environment, it's not going to grow in there. Parasites, bacteria, yeast. So we do have a lot of work to do there. So I should have you stay tuned for how that case uh, evolves. But that child is into, thank God, um, not aggressive to mom and dad, but to the little sisters. He's got three little sisters. And uh, he just thinks of ways to torture them. So we're going to see how we can improve that. Okay, let's see who's joining us. See, Danielle's on board. Hey, Danielle. Um, and Crystal, good. I'm glad you guys are, are joining us. So how do I manage this, this child with um, the hitting child? Well, I have to start with a history. And just like we talked about, I have to talk about how often we're having a bowel movement. What's our sleep pattern like? Do we need to add melatonin? You know, that kind of a thing. Uh, what foods are we eating? Are we eating a lot of sugar? Um, m many times the children can be nutritionally deficient. And again, the child that I was just uh, talking about earlier um, pretty much does fast food. No fruits except for an occasional apple. No vegetables. No supplements except for melatonin for sleep. So this kid's probably got scurvy, you know, vitamin C deficiency. Probably has a lot of vitamin deficiencies that I'm going to be looking for, um, whether it be vitamin A, vitamin E. And that can just make us a grouchy bear. We can't quite put our, our finger on it, but we're nutritionally deficient. Uh, mom is meeting his caloric needs. We're getting calories, but we're not getting protein or very little, whatever is in a Kentucky Fried Chicken Nugget. Okay, we're getting or a corn dog or deli meat. These are all processed foods, so nutritionally they're going to be um, pretty questionable. But we're not getting any minerals. We're not getting any vitamins. So probably not getting very good protein either. So there's a lot of work to do. But that is a child who's going to end up being more combative when told no. And uh, so you can see that we are going to have to work on the constipation component. We're going to have to work on the bacteria and or yeast component when I get those lab results back. We're going to start them on a multivitamin, a multimineral, um, like the ones that we have here at the office. And omega oils. No omega oils. It's just Kentucky Fried Chicken fat. That's the omega oil source. And remember, omega oils are very important to brain cell function because if you remember high school biology all of your cells have a lipid bilayer like a, a beach ball and that lipid which is another word for oil um, allows things to go in and out of the cell and it's going to operate one way when it's omega-3 fatty acids it's going to operate another way when it's mcdonald's french fry fat oil or kentucky fried chicken oil uh, it, it's just not going to work well we need oil <coughs> so we're going to and, you know, when you put kids on uh, omega oils, um, they tend to be anti-inflammatory and they help cells to work better. They kind of help you with the funk and the fog that's in the brain, the irritability. Uh, people can get really irritable just by having that diet. In fact, if you ask the parent, if you ate just what your child eats, how would you feel after a week or two or three? And you get the answer. So if you eat what your child eats, and it's not a good thing, that's kind of a, a clue that we have to change the dial, the diet. Uh, for our kids who are oppositional, very often the same criteria go. Um, you have to put them on vitamins, minerals, oils, and then you have to think about uh, methylation pathway defects, you know, the B12, the DMG, uh, carnitine, the, the B complex vitamins like B6 and all, very, very important because that's where SAMI is made and that helps with the mood and I can actually give them SAMI. But, uh, you know, I've had kids in my office who are very oppositional. I'll say, I'm a doctor, no you're not. The sky is blue, no it's not. No matter what you say, uh, it's oppositional. Not just asking them to take out the trash and no. Anything that you state as a statement, it, it's taken as a no. They're very exhausting kids. You know, these, these guys can just exhaust a parent. 
the supplements, you know, when I add supplements, I add them like I told you when I began here, um, very target specific, and I add them one at a time, waiting three or four days between them, just to make sure that I'm not triggering something negative uh, in them. Because anything I use, including vitamin C, can trigger some very poor behaviors. Um, omega oils can make them hyper, irritable, moody, cranky. Um, and they're just basically saying, I don't do well with these. But then I'll say, okay, let's try flax oil. Let's try avocado oil. Let's try something. Let's find something that, that uh, works really well with your child. And, and that's why when, when people are working with me, and I'll say, very often I, I rely on the thumbs test. And they'll say, the thumbs test, what's that? And I say, well, it's working for your kid. It's not doing anything bad or good, which is sometimes what we want. Or this is not good, okay? <clears throat> Medications. Um, this is where keeping a diary is always helpful when we actually start medications like seizure medicines or whatever that uh, we look at their behaviors be before and after because sometimes I get the, it's working really good for this particular thing but really bad for that. So I call that kind of like a sweet and sour sauce. It's like great for language but the kid's up all night screaming. So we can't use it. And, uh, and then again, I'm starting to think about Hormones, we've talked about this before. I'm looking at uh, adrenaline issues, uh, and I can watch the heartbeats, you know, like with the Fitbit watch, and then modify how our body responds to its, its stimuli that's triggering the adrenaline, and we can block the effects of adrenaline. Uh, and then, of course, if we're thinking about uh, precocious puberty, that's a fancy way of saying they're entering puberty before the right age. And for most of our kids on the spectrum, any age is the wrong age. Uh, but at least you don't want them at, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of age. Though the endocrinologist would be thrilled with that. You go in there with a, with a little girl in fourth grade, and uh, she's got breast bud elevation and pubic hair, and her behaviors are coming unglued. Oh, that's just normal, you know. And then they just blow it off. You're Hispanic, or you're African American, or some kids just develop early, and it's like, no, I don't need my fourth grader uh, going into puberty, thank you. Um, she's not doing well with the hormones. So there are things that we can do there, too. So you probably have lots of other reasons why um, kids are hitting you. And they're, they're, this was just a few of the main ones that I saw. But there are, are plenty of um, problems that our kids have to deal with from day to day in their own world, in their own way, that translate into them them hitting us <clears throat> sometimes we just can't figure out the cause and we have to remove the, the foods like we've talked about before being gluten-free dairy-free low sugar I think that uh, the wrong foods can also um, create an environment where the kids are hitting and again the, the child today which is a perfect example um, with the corn dog and Kentucky fried chicken diet I'll bet if I modify that and get the kid pooping every day we'll drop his his um, tendency to hit from say 90% to 20%. I mean, it won't it won't be magic. It won't totally go away. But I'll bet we're going to really get that nailed really soon. All right. So Crystal has joined us. Hi, and Adrian has also joined us. Hi. Um, some questions that we had from last week that uh, I thought we'd get to today. Um, do you recommend? Um, and safe and sound protocol uh, we got our aluminum tests results from metal screen 3 serum um, you know the metal testing and especially aluminum is is difficult aluminum is a very difficult uh, toxic metal to to remove from the body <clears throat> I know you've heard um, people talking about uh, certain silica waters like Fiji water may help al remove aluminum and again as, as you guys know I always say well how do you know how do we test the child's aluminum l level give them the silica water say say Fiji water and then test it later we test it coming out in the urine the stool what's what's actually happening here is it is it pulling aluminum from the brain we don't know we don't know what it's doing but you have people out there who are are quick to say this removes aluminum uh, I just checked with the uh, the president of the uh, American Academy of Environmental Medicine. Uh, these are our specialists who remove um, toxins from the body. 
And I said, what are we doing with aluminum still? And uh, it's uh, chelation with uh, IV EDTA is still the uh, preferred method of removing uh, aluminum from the body for sure because you can measure it in the urine, you know. Um, but aluminum is really tough. And then uh, remember the biggest problem is it's getting into the brain via the little white blood cells that eat the aluminum, the macrophage, and it brings it to the to the brain. So we have like a, a, a transport system for it. So pulling aluminum from the, the brain is is very, very difficult. Uh, I don't know if there are um, other ways that you could successfully get that out of the body. Uh, oral EDTA doesn't seem to be as effective. It's great uh, for removing lead, but uh, not so much the, uh, the aluminum. How can I find out if my son has Lyme or a PANS kid? Do you check titers? How could I have them tested? Uh, you know, the Lyme's panels, there are different Lyme's panels. I usually start with the ones that are, are covered by your insurance. So LabCorp and Quest have Lyme's panels. And, of course, the people who have developed Lyme's panels that are for fee, like $900, will tell you that those panels are no good. They don't have this band or that band. Um, but ours is best, and it's $900 cash because we don't take insurance. I start with the, the cheaper chicken and go with uh, the LabCorp or the Quest or your local hospital's Lyme panel and see if that pops positive, okay? Of course, it used to be in the old days we'd say, well, were you bit by a tick? Not that I know of. Then you probably don't have it. But we know now that we can have exposure and not even know it from a tick, or it could be transmitted from mom during pregnancy and delivery to the child. Uh, so there could be limes. But I usually start with uh, a limes panel and see what we have going there. So yes, I do check to see if there are uh, indications of limes. Pans or pandas, that's a, that's a real tough one. Like for example, I have, good question, I have a, a child today I'm worried about pans following a mono infection. Uh, seems that something happened after we had mono. And uh, that's usually caused by one of two viruses, cytomegalovirus or Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, the child did have a positive test for mono, and so I know what I'm dealing with, but uh, she really became severely obsessive-compulsive following that. Okay, I mean, it was, it was, the timing was just perfect uh, to say that she's got PANS or PANDAS. Now, PANDAS is um, the same thing, except it's caused by strep. So we're talking about the pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric syndrome, that's PANS. And if that PANS happens to be due to streptococcus, then we can call it PANDAS, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric syndrome associated with strep, so uh, disease associated with strep. So that's where you get the PANS, PANDAS. But it's the autoimmune component I'm worried about, okay, that autoimmune. The other folks will have you taking all kinds of antibiotics for a year or two. I, I've seen moms with uh, being treated for Lyme's, and they actually have a, a port surgically in place so they can get their IV antibiotics twice a week. They're, a, they're not really getting better, and B, they look terrible. They got that gray look to them, okay? And they don't feel good, but you're getting IV antibiotics twice a week for a year. Um, and you really haven't cleared your Lyme's disease. So I try to go at, uh, go a different approach with that. And uh, we may even consider helmet therapy or parasites. All righty. Um, let me see here. Should we be concerned if we're seeing an increase of keratosis polaris on my son's arms and what could be causing it? And can it can we help with the skin condition? All right, so keratosis polaris is a, first of all, a kind of a genetic problem where you have these like bumps on your outer upper arm. It could be the inner thighs. It could be the face, okay, on the cheeks. And if you talk to somebody who's really into viruses, they'll tell you it's, it's due to a viral, a stealth viral infection. If you talk to somebody who's into allergies, they'll say, oh, that's obvious for milk allergy. They flare up. I think we have them when, it, when it's genetic and mom has it or sister has it or aunt has it. 
but it can get worse with something that the body is irritated with, say like dairy or viruses. I think all these folks are right, um, but it's not always due to one thing. So I think we, we have it. Now, can you treat it? You can minimize it, obviously, if you're, if you're having uh, issues with a viral load or if you're having issues with uh, food allergies, you get rid of them um, and they, they become less inflamed, less red, less prominent, less noticeable. Uh, then there are creams now like like, like Hydrin that can uh, help minimize them even further, but you never really get rid of them. It's just a part of who you are. All righty. And let's see here. Um, Yolene asks about remedy testing. I don't know what remedy testing is. I'd have to look that up, and then I can tell you if it's uh, something I could recommend or not. So sorry, I don't have any options on that. Um, Samantha. Hey, Miss Samantha. It says, my daughter is constantly licking. Is this from a zinc or iron deficiency or something else? Thank you. OK, so licking. That's a good, that's a topic in itself. I have my kids who are lickers. Now, I don't know what she's licking. I have my hand lickers. I have my window lickers. I have my kids who lick uh, metal, like um, the, the, the prongs on a plug. They'll pull the plug out of the wall and they'll lick that. Uh, I have kids who lick glass. I have kids who lick their lips, lick their nose, uh, lick you, um, lick your hands. And uh, so I do have my kids who are, are lickers. So the, the symptom is licking. And what's that from? Remember, autism is an abnormal response to everyday stimuli. And, and the everyday stimuli is stuff in our world. And the abnormal response is having to lick it. Okay? Uh, so you then have to say, okay, drill down. What's the source of the licking? Or we could have been talking about spit play. The kids who play with spit, they wipe the spit put the spit on their face, they put the spit all over. My spit players, my liquors. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there is always a underlying uh, issue. Is it zinc? Is it iron? I can measure that. See, I'm a doctor. I can, I can actually do blood tests and say, all right, before I prescribe a whole bunch of stuff, like I think I know what I'm doing, I can actually look in the laboratory and see if there's a, a reasonable explanation. But I would say if you had a guess, um, I think I would put a child on iron, zinc, and selenium for my liquors first. Now, certainly the minerals, if I have a kid who's licking metal. If I have a metal liquor, um, those are kids who I might even actually go to a little store called Amazon.com and pick up a bottle of trace minerals, trace ionic minerals, and uh, I would start putting that in their drink. I would also put them on a, um, a mind salt. I like the Himalayan pink salt. Okay, because that also has great trace minerals. Uh, I'd be making sure that they're moving their bowels every day, twice a day. And then I would put them on magnesium as well. Now, I have a special form here of magnesium in my office that I call Remag. It's, it's kind of a uh, magnesium chloride. I mean, there's all kinds of magnesiums out there, like magnesium citrate, magnesium l 3 a magnesium bisglycinate. You probably have a magnesium something eight in your house. Um, but I think putting them on a lot of magnesium can also help with my lickosauruses. If they're licking their face, they will get big and red around here. I call those my clown lips. Their lips are chapped, and around the skin there, it's all red. And that's because um, saliva is a digestive enzyme, has digestive enzymes in it, I should say, and it will start digesting the face. So those kids who are constantly licking their hands, they're going to have a lot of eczema there. And the kids who have spit or saliva on their face, it's going to break out in redness. All right. So let's see here. Um, let's see. Julie says, hi, Julie. We love the Tycun products. That's T-I-K-U-N for those of you. Um, these are cannabis products. Uh, you suggested for our 10-year-old son that was hitting. He is much less aggressive, and we didn't need to increase his risperdone, uh, as suggested by a psychiatrist. He's a happy guy now. So what we're doing there from the hitting is the psychiatrist. Now, remember, when, when our families have actually seen a psychiatrist, we're talking about something really darn significant. You have to ask yourself, how bad would my kid have to be for me to take him to see a psychiatrist and agree to put him on a major psychiatric medication? 
that kid is generally one or two steps out of residential care or mom is one or two steps out of residence. Somebody's going to residential care if we don't fix this kid. So this child was put on Risperidol or Risperdone. And, um, you know, I think that's a fine um, bridge medication, something to uh, stabilize the child. I hate the drug, but sometimes we have to use it, like I say, because the, ser the seriousness of the condition. Remember, guys, I see some of the worst of the worst cases, um, and some of these kids will, like, push grandma downstairs. I had one kid who did that. And uh, so, I mean, it's like we have to be very careful. We can't, you know, we should only do things um, naturally. Uh, when we're talking about life and limb, like pushing grandma downstairs, um, and we're trying to, to play around with ashwagandha and valerian and stuff, you know, we don't have time for that. If it's a three or four year old, I mean, I've had four and five year olds come to me on Risperdal, and I'll take them right off of that. Okay, come on in. But when you got an older kid or a very dangerous child, uh, it's a good bridge drug while I figure out something else. So the Tycan, uh, what we're doing there is we're asking the question if I um, add cannabis to their current protocol, can I downregulate their need to, to hit, to push, to be? To be vicious and uh, it works very very well and the side effect profile you know it doesn't come with a black box warning all of those psych drugs they come with black box warnings this one doesn't um, so I like to use that and um, it, it I love it when a plan comes together I wish they all worked that way I mean all I did was just write Tykin every day and all the kids would be fine it doesn't always work that way but in this particular child it did thanks Julie for sharing that with everybody um, so here, Samantha adds a little bit more. If I touch her head, she licks her fingers and then uh, licks her head. You might mean hand, but maybe she licks her head. I don't know. But yeah, so that, that's kind of an obsessive compulsive thing. You know, um, like for example, in the, uh, in the 1960s, if you saw a hay truck, you do that. I mean, there's these, these weird rituals or OCDs that they kind of get into, which makes me wonder then, you trigger the stimuli and the physiologic response is the licking the hand and all. Um, that's an OCD. And so therefore we have to get into that can of worms and see if we can't break those ritual OCD kind of behaviors. <clears throat> okay, so, oh my goodness, we're getting plenty of uh, questions here. What's the best way, Tash asks, what's the best way to reduce a viral load Valtrex seems to be the most commonly prescribed antiviral for autism. Are there any other worthwhile options? Okay, so first of all, do we have a viral load? I mean, I don't want to be treating a, a, uh, a phantom viral load, something that doesn't exist. How do you know there's a viral load? Valtrex or valcyclovir, uh, it treats only a few of the viruses out there. Okay, so it's going to work on generally the herpes group of viruses of which we know of eight, there's probably more that we know of, but um, it generally works on the herpes viruses. Um, the herpes viruses are like canker sore herpes, type one, fever blisters, okay? Uh, herpes two is the genital, her genital herpes. Herpes three is chicken pox. Herpes four and five are the cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, the, the monos. Herpes six is um, herpes six. Seven and eight, they're usually associated with AIDS. <clears throat> so it can cause that. Now, remember the herpes virus, why would you put this herpes, the uh, oral herpes, you know, the canker sores and fever blisters in the same category as the sexual herpes, the herpes that you get on the genitals? Um, because they, they have um, some commonalities to them when they, when they try and figure out what virus group they belong to. And so the herpes group they, once we get them, we keep them forever, okay? So that's why they, they taught in high school, and now I guess it's gone to kindergarten. Uh, the difference between love and herpes is herpes is forever. Herpes lives in the dorsal root ganglia of the nerve cord and will come out and become zoster if it's chicken pox, canker sores here, of course, general herpes downstairs. So um, the herpes group is very sensitive to both the Valtrex, Valcyclovir, and Acyclovir, but you would never use that for a cold. Okay, adenovirus, rhinovirus, Coxsackie virus. There's lots of other, the SARS virus. So there's the best way to reduce the viral load 
is to improve your immune system's function, let your immune system reduce the viral load. Zinc, selenium, vitamin D, vitamin C, the antioxidants, the things that we've been talking about to help minimize our response to the, say, the SARS virus, a virus like you're saying, virus is a virus, are there some things that we can do to improve our immune system? I use something here called uh, immune power, empower, I-M-M-P-O-W-E-R, and uh, it, it's from the most honorable shiitake mushroom, and uh, to get the immune system to be a little more hypervigilant toward uh, the viruses. If we're worried about virus load in the gut, uh, we can use things like monolaurin, which is a derivative of coconut, and uh, there's we can use uh, colostrum, and then of course we can use um, things that are specific to help the immune system remove viruses from the gut. Uh, I use a product called SBI Protect, uh, and then some probiotics. So there are definitely some things that we can do, but if I really think that I have a kid who's who's a viral guy or gal, uh, I'll actually do some lab work to see if I can pin that down. What if, for example, as was in my son, it's the measles virus from the measles vaccine when they biopsied his lymph nodes in his gut, they found measles virus in there. Um, how do you take care of something like that? So what I'm trying to say to you is that just like everything else, whether it be a bacteria or a bad parasite, remember I said bad parasite, not a good one, uh, there are different things that we can use, but there's not one thing that we can use for everything. Good question, good question. All right, and I think, I think we've answered all of the questions for today. You guys are awfully quiet out there. Remember, this is your time for me to answer questions. Come to you every Wednesday, except for next Wednesday. I have to go visit my family in Tennessee, um, but I'll be back the following week. If you have any questions, you write them, you send it to us, I answer them, or you watch live and ask me live. So until I see you in two weeks, can't wait. I'm sorry, I'm going to miss you next week. Um, have a great time with your kids. Enjoy them. Love on them. Um, love them unconditionally. They need it. All right, guys. Have a blessed week, and we'll see you in two weeks. Take care now. Bye-bye.